On behalf of the International Continent Society, it really is my pleasure to welcome you to this live webinar. It has certainly been very uncertain times, and I hope everyone is staying very safe. So I am Marissa Clifton. I am an associate professor and director of women's health at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. I also act as the vice chair of safety and quality, and I'm the urology residency program director. And I have the very distinct honor of introducing my mentor and my colleague, Dr. Howard Goldman, who is a professor of urology and very well known to many in the audience. Um, he is also a vice chair of quality and safety and he's at Cleveland Clinic. He is an active mentor in the International Continent Society and I argue that he has really been an incredible educator for many of us, especially people like myself, the young surgeons out there. So I'm grateful to also have him as a friend. We are thrilled to have you join us today, and we are going to be discussing the surgical techniques in autologous pubovaginal sling placement. So we know that autologous slings have been a mainstay in treatment for patients with stress incontinence for decades. But uh, when the mid-urethral sling came onto the scene, we realized it was easy, it was effective and relatively safe. However, with growing concerns of mesh and mesh litigation, we have moved uh, away from this technique and we thought it would be a very appropriate topic to discuss in the current times. So uh, without further ado, uh, I introduce Dr. Howard Goldman and thank you again for joining us today. Okay. Thank you. Are, are you able to see my screen? Yes, I am. Perfect. All right. So I am thrilled to be here. And again, on wait a second. All right. I'm thrilled to be here. And again, I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to work with the International Continent Society. And I'm thrilled to have Marissa as my moderator. So as she said, I think for many of us around the world, for many, many years, the mid synthetic sling has been our go-to treatment for stress incontinence. And I think for many, it still is. However, um, there are some parts of the world where the use of that sling has been limited. And in many parts of the world, because of various things that patients see as far as litigation and as far as potential complications, uh, many patients have shied away from using the mid sling. Uh, okay, let's see, having some trouble advancing my slide. There we go. Okay, so I have no disclosures and I believe Marissa has none as well when it comes to this topic. So again, as she alluded to, the autologous fascial sling was popularized back in the 80s for stress incontinence. There were some versions of it done many, many years prior to that. But for many years, it was used for really the worst case scenarios. Those who had failed a Birch, had failed a modified Pereira, something of that nature. Uh, the nice thing about it is it utilizes the patient's own tissue. But again, as we've alluded to, it sort of faded into the background for the last 15 years or so because of the popularity of the synthetic sling. But because of the things we've just discussed, there does seem to be a resurgence that has come about. So let's talk about some of the indications for the autologous fascial sling. So it's obviously indicated for stress incontinence, and it could be done for all patients or for many of the patients who need some sort of anti-incontinence procedure. Many of people have advocated it specifically for those with perhaps no urethral mobility or low valsalva leak point pressures. Clearly, many patients who've had a previous mesh complication uh, may not want another mesh procedure. There are also a group of patients who may have poor healing where a synthetic may not be ideal. And finally, there are some situations where clearly we do not want to put a foreign body. So if you're doing a concomitant diverticulum, urethrovaginal fistula, where you actually have an entrance and a suture line that's going to be at the, at the urethra, most of us, and I think it's even in the AOA guidelines, they say do not put a mid synthetic sling in that situation. And then, of course, there are many patients or physicians who might be concerned about mesh risks who would advocate going for an autologous fascial sling. So when we talk about autologous fascial slings, there are really two main harvest sites. And so, again, we'll mention later on some other biologic slings, but we're going to focus really on a patient's own tissue here. So 
Traditionally, many people have gotten it from the abdomen, from the rectus fascia. And the nice thing about that is typically for most fascial slings, you end up having to go up to that area to pass the sutures and to tie things. Um, so many people have used that because it's all the same incision. However, as we'll see later, there may be some higher rates of wound complications with that technique. Something else that people have looked at and have been doing are harvesting fascia lata. In general, fascia lata is a pretty reliable piece of fascia. It's relatively easy to get at. However, you do need a separate prep. You have to prep the leg, a separate incision. There seem to be fewer wound complications, and there may be some patients who it may actually be a lot easier, perhaps the very obese patients or those who've had multiple prior surgeries. I'm just going to start a little video here uh, that was done by my colleague, Sandra Fasavara, and uh, some of the fellows just indicating how they go about harvesting a fascial sling. So as you can see, they sort of mark off uh, where the fascia lata would be. And now they've gone ahead and completely prepped and draped that area. And what they're gonna do is they're actually going to make an incision, as you can see here, a few centimeters above the epicondyle. And what they're essentially gonna do is numb up that area and then go ahead and harvest from that area. So I'll just sort of skip ahead for a second. So there they've gone ahead and they've gotten down to the fascia. Then they're going to hydrodissect above the fascia. And essentially through this one incision, they're going to harvest the fascia. And as you'll see in a moment, there are a number of different techniques. You can use a fascial stripper, you can use two incisions, but in this case, what they've chosen to do is to really just work through that one incision and so here they are making the incision on one side. And then what they're going to do is they're going to sort of work that incision. So they're undermining it there. And then they're going to slowly, by uh, retracting, try to get about 8 to 10 centimeters of fascia. And they're able to do this through one incision. I'll just jump ahead. They sort of measure how far they have to get down. And then ultimately, I've skipped ahead, ultimately they go ahead and, and amputate that piece of fascia. So there it is. They've got a nice eight centimeter by two centimeter piece of fascia. And again, when, when doing this, we don't close the fascia lata, they're just closing the skin here. And then they can go on um, and use that piece of fascia later on. In this case, they're just giving a little anti uh, more anesthesia. And then they go ahead and do a little bit of a wrap there just to prevent a hematoma from forming. So as I said, there are some other techniques. Marissa, this is something that uh, she has done. So why don't you describe this? So this is what we did when I was a resident at the Mayo Clinic. And basically the benefit of this two incision approach is that you can harvest theoretically a longer piece of fascia. So if you look, you can see that the lateral epicondyle is marked and proximal to this. We did about five centimeters, but the range is three to five. You make another horizontal marking approximately two centimeters in length. You can then determine the length of the fascia you'd like to harvest. And this allows you to maybe use this for other procedures, for an autologous um, fascial sacral copalpexy or, or some other reason to harvest uh, the fascia. So you can clearly determine the length that you would like. Um, on the next page, you'll see we've create we've deepened the incision down to the fascia, and we over sew basically distal to the fascia we're going to harvest, maybe to prevent fraying, but you don't close the entire fascial defect. That just isn't possible. So we've basically revealed the fascia lata and then we've over sewn and before we amputate it, um, uh, we make sure that we have good hemostasis. So in the next slide, you'll see that the fascia has been um, isolated with a Penrose drain. And now we're dissecting between the proximal and distal uh, incisions with just gentle, gentle traction and then blunt dissection. And you'll see that the overlying tissue really kind of is freed easily above the fascia lata. 
We've pulled the fascia lata through the proximal incision, and you can see we have 10 centimeters there. And in the next picture, you'll see that it's been harvested, and it's actually a really nice, clean piece of fascia to use. And then the incisions are closed very similarly with a little bit of local, and, and um, from an aesthetic standpoint, really do look appealing, and um, the patients tolerate this quite well. So another technique is where people actually use a fascial stripper. And I'm just going to lower the volume here. And so typically, they make an incision at the distal area. And I would think some of my colleagues from UCLA and uh, from Italy who have actually uh, contributed to this video. So what you'll see there is they sort of start the same way. And they start with that uh, skin incision, get down to the fascia, and start to dissect the fascia. And then they put a little suture through it. And as you'll see in a moment, they're actually going to run that suture through a fascial stripper. And what this does is it sort of pulls that piece of fascia through this little stripper, and you can then just follow it along for whatever depth you want. So there goes the fascia into the stripper. And now they're going to grab the fascia so that it doesn't tear through the suture. And now they can really just slide that thing down. And you can see there are length markers on the device. And they're going to slide it to where they want it to go. And then they turn the little thing that makes the blade engage at the end. And then that chops off the distal end. And now when they pull it all out, They've just got a nice piece of uh, fascia. They have just one incision, and they didn't have to do too much pulling and yanking. So this is just another approach for that. And I've heard that some of our colleagues call in plastic surgery to do the fascial stripping, but this pr procedure is actually pretty straightforward if you're familiar with the device. Wouldn't you agree, Howard? Yes. I mean, I think this is something that, you know, if you've never done it before, maybe do maybe the first time you can do it with with uh, one of your other colleagues, but after the first time, I think it's something that we should be able to do on our own. So moving on to rectus fascia. So this, again, many of us are more familiar with this because we generally have to go above and make an incision anyhow. And so there are different techniques. I think the traditional, original techniques that were popularized by many of the our uh, prior uh, generation of sort of father forefathers in this field used much longer pieces of fascia, sometimes up to 15, 20 centimeters that came all the way around. Most of us are using six to eight centimeters of fascia, just enough fascia to get back into the rectal pubic space. Um, and it's, it's fairly easy to do. So it's just through a six to eight centimeter skin incision, about two centimeters above the pubis. I usually use about eight centimeters, but you really, if you want to, you can get up to like 10 or 12 easily. So essentially, you make two parallel incisions through the fascia. I will tell you, it's interesting because when you take that piece of fascia out, the width of the fascia looks smaller than you started, whereas the defect behind expands and looks tremendous. But anyhow, either way, you just go ahead and harvest that fascia. And I'm just going to show now a quick video from uh, our, our friends at Mayo Clinic. Uh, Brian Linder was generous enough to share this with me. 10 centimeter fan and steel incision, two finger breadths above the pubic symphysis is made and dissection is carried down to the rectus fascia. Using the index finger as a guide for both length and width, a two centimeter by 10 centimeter rectus graft is incised with cautery and dissected free from the underlying muscle. It is important to preserve the lateral attachments to facilitate placement of 2O proline suture. These sutures are left long as they will be used in sling passage. The lateral attachments of the sling are then dissected free. These steps are then repeated on the opposite side. Once the lateral attachments are free, the mid portion of the rectus fascia is then dissected off of the linea alba. Care is taken to avoid damaging the sling in this critical region that will be placed directly under the urethra. The sling is then placed in normal saline. Fascia is then closed using running bicral suture. At this point, the graft is defatted and excess tissue is removed. 
So how, so how do, you do you ever use a lateral aspect for the dissection rather than going in the midline and kind of having to do, do additional dissection? So I usually actually just dissect out the entire rectangle, sort of. And then mm -hmm. I just start from the lateral edge and just, it usually comes right off the underlying muscle. And the only part that you actually have to cut is when you come across the linea alba. I've seen where people actually cut the sling in half. So be careful, pull it up a little bit. And sort of you may want to just take a little deeper cut there. Um, that's what I do. I know some people like uh, you just saw put the suture materials in beforehand before they actually dissect it off. I like to kind of take the whole thing off. And then on the back table, I put the sutures in. All right. So there have been some studies actually looking at comparing these two approaches. And so you can see the operative time for an entire sling using either one is really about the same. I think the big difference here that there seem to be a few more wound complications in the rectus fascia uh, harvest. And I think part of that is also just due because that's the area where you're going to be approaching to pass your needles down to the vaginal area where you're going to be um, cutting. There's a lot more fat there. And so I think there is the potential to develop a little bit of a seroma, seroma or a wound infection. Again, the, the pro of doing this is that it's one incision. You don't have to go down and spend time in the leg. But I think the trade-off is that you may have a little more of a wound issue just because in general, a lot more fat that you're going through there and it's a little more vascular. We have a question from the audience. They want to know if you use a permanent suture or if you're using more of a PDS type of suture, a suture that's maybe long-term absorbable um, because of the concerns about permanent materials. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. And so those are, we're talking about the sutures, I think, that are at the end of the sling that are then going to be the ones that are brought up and tied across the midline or however you tie it. I originally used proline. But it's interesting, the original descriptions, um, McGuire and some of them actually use Vicryl because the idea is, and we'll see this in a moment, when you perforate through the endopelvic fascia from below, the idea is that the ends of this fascial sling should be in the rectal pubic space. And within a week or two, they actually scar in pretty strongly. So they used to use Vicryl, which seems to be satisfactory. Um, I have a number of years ago, I, I switched to using PDS. So I think I get a little longer, takes a little longer till the sutures go away, but ultimately the sutures go away and it's dependent purely on the um, scarring that occurs. Uh, when you look at the actual success rates, you can see here, I think they're about the same. So I don't think from a, an outcome standpoint, there's much difference. So I would, I would suggest, you know, if, if it's someone who's really chunky and you're afraid, or they've had a lot of scar tissue there, you're afraid of uh, just difficulty harvesting the uh, Rectus fascia, fine to go ahead down below. Some people prefer going down below to uh, fascia lata, and I think that that's fine, whichever one things pick. All right, moving on to the vaginal dissection. So generally, he will, most people will do either an inverted U or a midline incision centered at the bladder neck, and you can always place some traction on the catheter so you can sort of palpate the proximal edge of the Foley balloon so you know where the bladder neck is. And then ultimately we dissect laterally and cephalad under the vaginal wall. Um, we try to stay pretty superficial right beneath the skin level, go up under the pubis and then generally perforate the endopelvic fascia. So this would just show, I happen to like uh, to do an inverted U incision. And so once, and I, I take it back a bit further than this illustration. And then once I have that inverted U taken down, I'll grab the lateral edges and then I just carefully work underneath that sort of towards the ipsilateral shoulder, just doing some sharp and uh, just a lot of spreading. And ultimately what you should do is almost get right under the, the pubis, right where the endopelvic fascia is. And at that point you can sort of feel it. And either sometimes with my finger, I can sometimes just poke through the endopelvic fascia, or sometimes it actually requires taking your Mayo scissor. And what I do is I kind of pop through right under the bone and then I spread it and pull it out so there's enough room for my finger to fit in there. And typically it should feel pretty um, slippery. If you're right under there under the periosteum in the right plane, you should feel it should feel pretty slippery. I, I find that some of our residents have a little bit hard um, time entering into that space because it's a really I think intimidating area for them. So what I've always 
ask them to do is maybe point the tips of your scissors, your mayos towards the ipsilateral shoulder and your patients in Trendelenburg. And if you have them lined up and they push forward, and as you said, strongly kind of open those scissors and pull backwards, you can develop this space quite well. And that gives them a trajectory so they know where to aim. And I found that's been a little bit helpful for them when they're not as experienced getting into that space. Yeah, I think with the residents, what I, what I frequently find is they get right to that point, but then mm-hmm. they they're afraid to apply the force that you really need to pop through. And after they see me do it once or twice, and we'll see in one of the videos here, you'll actually see that little pop. So let's just show this is, um, again, from my partner, Santa Savita, from a video of his. Let's just show this is sort of the dissection. So the, here they're actually dissecting under the vaginal wall. They're going ahead and making an inverted U incision, and they've done that. And now they've sort of gently dissected up under the vaginal wall, and you'll see they're about to pop through the endopelvic fascia. You'll, so they've sort of got finger guidance to make sure that they're not they're away from the bladder. And in a minute, you'll see that pop. There, there it is. So that's the pop. Again, you want to, I would aim it just a tad more laterally. Um, and then as you, as you can see, as they're pulling it out, they've actually spread it. So as they pull it out, um, they make a little bit of a space so one's finger can fit up there. So they'll be able to actually guide the staining needles out. Now, sometimes at that point, I'll just stop the video for a second. Um, sometimes at that point, you'll have a gush of blood because you may hit some little vein there or something. My suggestion, if that happens, is just put a little packing there for the moment. Continue with doing the other side, continuing with uh, going above. And when you get to the point that you're going to pass your stamen needles or whatever instrument down, you'll just take out your little packing. And then one, generally, once you pull the sling back in there, it sort of tamponades it and it stops the bleeding. Because um, it's really hard to go up there and find where the bleeding is. And so I would just try to slow it down, continue. And then once you get the sling in place, it usually stops. So this just shows the technique. If you've harvested the fascia and you're putting the sutures on in the back table, what I will tell you is I actually do this before I do the step we just showed you. I have my sling ready before we actually go ahead and start perforating. Uh, that way, if you do get into any bleeding or anything, uh, the length of time that you have to have that bleeding going on is a lot less. So there are a lot of different ways of doing it. Um, here they're going to sort of knit, knit it through. Uh, some people sort of knit it through and then tie the end. There are different ways of doing this. I'm not sure that anyone is any better. I think it's important to mark the midline of the graft because once you put it in, it all looks the same and it can sometimes be hard to tell where the midline is because you kind of want this set down evenly. Um, I think we've shown that. So let's get to trocar passage. So we've talked about harvesting the fascia and we've talked about um, uh, doing your vaginal dissection and getting into that endopelvic area. And, and I would say there was a time that people said, oh, we don't need to per- perforate through the endopelvic fascia and get into that retropubic space. And I think there were actually some papers that showed that the success rate was not quite as good because I think it's when you perforate that endopelvic fascia and get in, get the ends of your, your sling in that area, that's where it really scars up nicely and that's what's gonna hold everything together. So as far as the trocar passage, now you've made an incision up above, You've got your tunnels sort of dissected um, from the vagina up uh, through the endopelvic fascia. Uh, And now what you're going to do is you're going to pass an instrument, whether it's a stamen needle, some parer needle, or some people use just a a sharp clamp or something. You sort of pass that through the rectus fascia onto your finger and um, into the vagina. And so what we do is we just stick our finger all the way up in there. I actually pass, you'll see a little stamen needle. I don't want my finger right under it as I pass it because I don't want to stick my finger. So once I kind of feel it, I know where it's going to be. I back my finger up, pass it through, and then use my finger to guide it out. And then once you've got it in the vagina, you'll thread the suture through it or grab it. You'll pull the sutures up, and then you'll get the sling into the position you want. So this just shows shows a, a clamp actually being brought down from your prepubic incision. And under finger guidance, you bring it into the vagina, and then they're going to grab uh, the suture material and bring it back up. A lot of us use stamen needles for that, and we'll just show you that now. 
So this is the case. This is the same case where they did the fascia lata harvest at the beginning. So now they're making their incision. They've got their finger up all the way into the rectus pubic space from below. They kind of feel where it needs to be. And then they're going to pop that stamen needle through and bring it down into the vaginal area. Marissa, anything special you do at this point? Well, I just like to put basically my finger all the way up through that tunnel where you're underneath the rectus fascia. So you can almost feel you're in the right space. So you've gone completely around the bladder. You know exactly where your stem is coming in as it tents onto the fascia before you pop through it. Um, I think that some people pass two stamies before doing it. Some people do one at a time. Uh, some people are doing cystoscopy. So the discussion of cystoscopy at the time of sling placement is maybe something that you could comment a little bit on um, because if you're using an absorbable suture, how important is it? So I, I do cystoscopy for all of these. And here we go. You can see us doing cystoscopy. Shout out to Dr. Giusto there on the side. Um, but we do cystoscopy uh, at that point. We do it before we pull the sutures back because it's a lot easier. I'll just go back for a second. It's a lot easier to see the um, it's a lot easier to see the metal bars in the or the, the trocars in the bladder than it is sometimes the suture and what we use so this you can see on the the film there they've just they're looking in the urethra but we we look in the urethra we look in the bladder we want the bladder full um, usually it's going to be at about one or two o'clock in about 10 or 11 o'clock and what you can usually do is by just wiggling along around the stamy uh, needles or wiggling around uh, your trocar or whatever you're using your 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 um clamp down there you can see the impression on the outside of the bladder if you do see it coming through the bladder even though i use absorbable suture i would probably back it up and redo it certainly if you're using permanent suture um, you you would want to do it I, I think the standard is that uh, for the for almost all slings uh, we want to do a cystoscopy and just make sure that we're not in the bladder and then another important aspect is making sure your bladder's empty before you end up passing your trocars, similarly to doing yes. a synthetic mid-urethral sling. Yes. And so here what you see is they're actually passing the sutures from the graft. This is a stamen needle, so there's a little hole at the end. This can sometimes be the more, most challenging part of the case. And then you're going to pull those sutures back up into the, above the erectus fascia, and now they're going to do it at the other side. And here you can see the benefit of having that mark in the middle, because ultimately when you, when you lay everything out, you'll know exactly where you are. So again, I'd, um, so we've now pulled up the sutures. And so now the question is, and this is sort of the hardest part, I think, because there's not too much science on this. This is just a lot of experience and learning from the right people. So you've laid your, your sling appropriately in the midline. And what I actually like to do, I'll just go back to that video, just the last second there. Um, what I like to do after you pull both sides up is at this point, once you've pulled this edge up, I actually will put a little forovicral suture here and a forovicral here. And what I do is by pulling on the Foley balloon, I know exactly where the bladder neck is. And where I'd like to do this is the proximal portion of the sling will be sutured just a little bit proximal to the bladder neck, and the distal portion is usually somewhere um, almost to the mid urethra. So it's sort of this sling, this is a traditional fascial sling, which is really um, sitting primarily under that bladder neck, a little proximal to the bladder neck, and then a little bit into the proximal uh, urethra. And do now, you do that to prevent uh, rolling of the fascial sling, uh, preserve where the placement is, or a combination of both? A combination of both. I want, I I want the, the sling to be exactly where I left it. And so the other thing is that allows you to kind of use the full width of the sling so it doesn't get curled up or anything like that. And I, I just put two sutures in the midline, one on either side. Uh, some people put four sutures. I think uh, it's however you like to do it. Okay, so we've we've got the fascia down there, and then um, now there are different ways people do it. One thing that I have done is we sort of just do a quick cysto and pull up on the sutures from above, just to make sure that the um, that when we pull up on the sutures, we see that bladder neck area getting elevated, and that just confirms that we are in the right spot. 
Um, if, if we see a little pulling that's a little more sort of in the proximal or towards the mid urethra, I think that's okay. But I think if you see most of the pulling up sort of coming at the bladder base so that you're too proximal to the bladder neck, then I don't think that's a good position and you want to move it a little distally. As far as tying the sutures, so we don't want it too tight. This procedure um, runs the risk of causing obstruction and you really want to leave everything loose. And there are different techniques for the looseness of the loop. Most people sort of colloquially say we leave two or three finger breaths between the fascia and the knot where we tie it. But again, if you're pulling up tight on those sutures, you can leave all the finger breaths there, but as soon as you take your fingers out, it's gonna really tighten up. Um, some people have the technique where they push down on the urethra with a scope while they're pulling the sutures up and then let the sutures kind of just tie loosely. Um, some tie separately on either side. And there's actually um, other opinions. I will just tell you, here's sort of a quote from uh, Jerry Blavis, who again is one of the pioneers of this procedure. And I, I think it's worth reading. He says, to avoid placing the sling on tension, the sutures on each end of the sling are pulled upward while downward pressure is applied to the cystoscope. This technique depresses the vesicle neck and puts the sling on stretch. The sutures are then released and the cystoscope is removed while a Q-tip is placed in the urethra. And if the urethral angle is measured by the Q-tip is negative, then you sort of pull down a little more on the sling to loosen it up. And ultimately you want the Q-tip to be at about zero. And once they're at zero, then you can tie them relatively loosely with two or three fingers um, between the sutures and the rectus fascia. So let's just sort of see a little film of that being done. So again, they've, I think there's a little cystocele there that they may want to address, but they're leaving, they're leaving an instrument actually right at the level of the fascia so that they don't pull it up. It's probably between the sling and the underlying tissue. And you can see up here, they have an instrument sort of at the skin level, and this is a little bit of a chunky patient, the idea being that that's going to leave uh, sort of an air knot in that area so that it's not tightened up too much. And in this case, so this one, they're actually doing the midline fixation, which we talked about sort of after they have um, adjusted the sling from above. And you can see they've put a uh, suture through the edge of the fascia. And now they're, they're suturing it to the tissue that's underneath. And then again, I would put one of these sutures um, on the proximal end, one on the distal end. And at this point, they're going ahead to close the vaginal wall. Now, again, other people go ahead and put those sutures in the sling just to stabilize them first. And then they close this, the fascia. I'm, I'm sorry, they close the vaginal wall. And then they go up above and they, um, and they tie the sutures. So let's just look at an interesting procedure recap. And this is sort of from beginning to end from our management of female stress incontinence. Tension can then be turned to the vaginal duct section. With the Foley catheter in the bladder, a Pratt clamp is used to evert the anterior vaginal mucosa, and the bladder neck is identified by palpation of the catheter balloon. And again, there, there are a lot of different ways to skin your vaginal. A lot of ways to skin a cat. I like to use an Alice clamp, but uh, I think there are a lot of ways and techniques that people can do. Traction. We prefer simple beaver with handle resting in a pouch made from the surgical drape. At this point, an inverted U incision is drawn out and saline injection is performed for hydrodissection. The anterior vaginal mucosa is then dissected back to the bladder neck, keeping a superficial plane. This is facilitated by you. Whoops. Did I stop that? I mean, you may have. That's because I wanted I wanted us to see a good view of Marissa. Hold on. <laughs> let's get that. Let's get that. There we go. I think it's important to know that these need to be kind of thick flaps, so it's at a, a, a deeper depth than when you're doing an anterior coprophy, and you're gonna have more bleeding. I would also, I would, I would say that there is, there is a very specific plane that you need to get into. And mm -hmm. if you get into that plane early, it really just, you can almost put a little sponge over your finger. And the whole thing sweeps off easily. And, and if you're in the right plane, you really don't have much bleeding, hopefully. Um, but there is, there is sort of a little technique to, to get these right. Finger guides the Metzenbaum scissors to the level of the endopelvic fashion. 
In general, the scissor should be aimed at the hip's lateral shoulder with tips oriented laterally and at a steep angle in such a way that allows the scissors to travel along the posterior aspect of the pubic bone and away from the black or neck. Once the endopelvic fascia is perforated, the scissors are spread and removed with blades open to create a two centimeter wide opening. A finger is used to bluntly develop the space of retsius up to the level of the rectus muscle belly, making sure to sweep from lateral to medial direction, again avoiding the bladder and bladder neck tissues. While we prefer a correa ras ligature carrier to pass the sling through the retropubic space in a top-down approach, one should ensure that a fascial bridge of at least one centimeter is created for the proline sutures to pass. A finger is used to guide the ligature carry into the vaginal incision and thereby avoid injury to adjacent structures. The sutures are, are thus transferred from the vaginal dissection to the abdominal incision. So you see here, a, a, whoops, 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 whoops. You see here a slightly different technique where instead of using that single uh, stamen needle, they've got double arm Pereira. So they actually bring both sutures up on either side, and ultimately they're going to have a fascial bridge between them. So let's just go back to where they were there. Thereby avoid injury to adjacent structures. The sutures are, are thus transferred from the vaginal dissection to the abdominal incision. The sling should be positioned so that it is symmetric and lies flat just below the bladder neck. Chromic tacking sutures are then placed in four quadrants to ensure the sling provides a flat and broad base support. The U-shaped anterior vaginal wall incision is closed with running vicryl and betadine soaked gauze is used as vaginal packing. So this is sort of how I do it, where I actually bring, I use the just single stamy, but I bring the sutures up into the uh, prepubic area. Then I go and tack down the fascia, and then I close the vaginal wall. I actually don't use a vaginal packing, rarely, just because typically, once you get the sling in place, the bleeding is really minimal. So I, I personally don't use a vaginal packing, but there's clearly a lot of ways to do this. Removal in the immediate postoperative setting. Cystoscopy must be performed to ensure an appropriate lack of tension unless one is using this procedure to obstruct the bladder neck in cases of urethral erosion and to rule out urethral, ureteral, or bladder injury. A 70-degree lens should be used to inspect the bladder as perforations, if they occur, will most frequently be just inside the bladder neck between 10 and 2 o'clock. We discuss intermittent self-catheterization versus suprapubic catheter placement with all patients undergoing fascial sling placement. This patient elected for placement of a suprapubic catheter. This is placed under cystoscopic guidance with the patient in full Trendelenburg and the bladder completely distended. We prefer use of the Lawrence suprapubic PLA catheter entry. So this, this is something that I do not do. Um, what I do, and the reason I don't do it is I don't like to make another hole. And you know, even a simple suprapubic catheter can sometimes have morbidity. Um, I, generally, these patients sometimes have a little difficulty voiding right away. So my standard, and I, I'd prefer not to teach them CSC, I usually just leave a Foley in and have them come back five, six days later for a, um, for a uh, trial of void. Marissa, what do you do? Um, I do it very similarly. I think leaving a woman with a suprapubic catheter can kind of change this from being a routine in and out procedure to something a little bit more involved. So even that perception can, I think, be pretty... Um, severe for some of our patients. And it is, it's another tube, it's another bag, it's another thing that can weep. And if you you need to put it separate from your incision, because it can break down your already susceptible incision. So I think that's an important point as well. As many of our patients will have had prior suprapubic incisions, we find it beneficial to replace the plastic trocar for a heavier metal trocar. Urine is then confirmed to be effluxing from both ureteral orifices. With the cystoscopic sheets still in place to ensure that no tension is placed in the sling suit. So you'll notice they do this a little differently in the sense that they tie independently on each side. And I know there are many people who tie independently on each side, and then that's it. So they don't actually then tie it in the midline. I think what, what these guys are about to do is they tie separately on each side, and then they're going to tie over the midline. Um, my practice is generally I don't tie on either side. I just have the two sutures coming up on one side, the two on the other, and then I just tie everything across the midline. But again, different ways to Here's do this. And tied together above the rectus fascia with room for one to two fingers beneath the knot. The skin is enclosed and the procedure is concluded. So I, so I misstated it there, actually. So what they did is they just brought each one, each set of sutures up top, 
and tie them separately. And I know there are there are some people who advocate very much that you should tie these separately. Um, other people just as well are, are as big advocates as not tying them separately and then bringing them across. And I, I'm not sure there's any ends are then tied together above the rest of the fascia. So we had a question from the audience and we want to know when you're passing the stamen needle from above, how far is it from the midline? How do you measure where your passage of your stamen is from the midline down to that's, the vaginal incision? So that, that, that's a good question. I usually go about two to three centimeters from the midline. So I sort of go at the, at the end of my incision. Um, it's probably about two to three centimeters from the midline. That's just, just how I do it. How do you do it? Um, I've seen it done a lot of different ways. I, I kind of do it similarly to a top down uh, synthetic in terms of not really having that big of a gap, because if you don't have a big incision, like you aren't doing a rectus fascial sling, then it becomes a little bit more challenging. So if I'm doing fascia lata, I'd want to have a smaller incision anyway. Yeah. And, and I also, I don't pass, I've already, by the time we get to this point, I've closed my fascial defect above. So I'm not passing it through the, the suture line of the fascial defect. I'm actually usually passing it below that. Mm -hmm. It's include harvesting a long and broad rectus fascial segment, inverted U vaginal incision for adequate exposure and securing sling placement at the bladder neck, limited perforation of the pelvic fascia, appropriate suspension allowing for space between knots and the rectus fascia, and cystoscopy to evaluate for bladder perforation and sling tension. So I think tensioning is is going to be um, always a an interesting topic, and I know that you do in this situation. You have closed your vaginal incision. What I tend to do is I tend to hold the fascia laterally on both sides as I have my person up above tying. And the reason that I do this is I feel that the once the fascia the fascial sling has gone through the endopelvic fascia, it can kind of get cemented in place. So I want to make sure it's not too taut, even if you leave a loose knot, that it's not too taut al along the urethra to obstruct. And so I, I think there are a lot of different ways, but you've got to have uh, in the back of your mind, making sure not to over tension that sling. Right. And, and I mean, I've, I've seen many cases where we thought we weren't over tensioning it. You know, you thought it was, well, that, that's a pretty nice loop. And in the end, they did have some bladder outlet obstruction. I think there's a nice, you know, what I do also is after I do tie it above, I then sort of pull down on the Foley catheter to sort of just, you know, pull loosen it down it. a little bit, loosen mm -hmm. it. I, there was a recent paper that I thought, you know, not, people really haven't put much science into this, but this is a recent paper where they actually did some science on how to optimize the tension. So I think it's worth reviewing. And essentially what they did is they did a whole series of these patients and they measured whatever their loop was, and they had a very generous loop, they measured two things, the distance from the knot down to the fascia, and then also that width, which someone just asked us about. And what they really found is <clears throat> the most important thing, so blue is no retention, yellow is patients who had temporary retention, which I'm okay with temporary because it resolves, it gets better, and red were the ones that had a problem with retention. And as you can see, uh, when the um, height from the fascia to the knot was somewhere at about three and a half to four centimeters, which is a pretty generous loop, above that point, really none of these patients had any lasting retention. And yet they didn't seem to compromise the outcomes in the efficacy for stress incontinence. So we've actually tried to um, make our, our knots somewhere in that sort of three to four centimeter range. Uh, in a skinny patient, a four centimeter loop can look pretty, pretty loose, uh, but so far so good. So uh, I think this is this is actually was a nice paper. And so what they, their conclusion here was stretching the sling suspensions, sutures about four centimeters above the fascia was associated with lower risk of retention than uh, below that. And this should, appears worth evaluating in a larger sample and did not seem to compromise the cure of SUI. So this is just something that's a recent paper, something just food for thought. I just want to sort of uh, end up here. Uh, people have also looked, because again, there's been a tremendous interest in the mid-urethral synthetic slings, and people have looked at moving these fascial slings more to the mid-urethra. Um, here's one of the papers where they did a, it's really about the same graft, seven by one and a half centimeters, maybe a little thinner, 
And their early results were similar to a tr traditional approach. There have been some other papers that looked at this, but the bottom line here is what they're essentially doing is just um, moving maybe a slightly thinner sling um, down to the mid to distill urethra. And from a post-op standpoint, so I do all these patients as outpatients. Uh, I, I may push the envelope. I do all my robotic sacrocopexies, all my major prolapses. I do everybody pretty much as an outpatient. I don't like to come in around the next day. And I think patients, I think patients do pretty well. I think patients do really well at home. But so we do it as an outpatient. Um, most of the discomfort is at the fascial harvest site. And so we put some bupivacaine there at, at the end. We also use some IV ketorolac at the end of the case, which seems quite helpful. Um, you can do a trial avoid in the recovery room and see if they can go without a catheter. But I, I've, many times they can't. And I've had instances where they thought they could, and then they go home, and then they have to come back to get a catheter. So I generally send them home with a full catheter. Uh, and we, they just come in next week, and we do a trial avoid. And most are able to avoid, and some it takes a little longer. And I generally don't teach them to do CIC at that point. I'll just put a catheter in for another week or two and have them come back. As far as complications, I think we do have to recognize that bladder outlet obstruction does occur here. And I think even in the best of hands, it can occur in at least probably 10% of patients. Uh, one thing that people sometimes get mixed up about is just because you're voiding with a low post void residual does not mean that you're not obstructed. If you've got a good, strong bladder and a good detrusor, contraction. Even if you're obstructed at high pressure, you can get that fluid out. So I always ask them about the flow. I say, compared to before we did surgery, how's the flow? If before was 100%, what is it now? And if they tell me, oh, it's 100% or 90% or great, you know, fine. But if they tell me, yeah, you know, it's just like 50% or it's just a little trickle, those are the ones that I start to get a little concerned about. Um, again, with fashion, with as opposed to synthetic slings where I expect them to be voiding normally within a few days. With fascial slings, um, sometimes those patients um, can take a little while until uh, they start voiding more normally. A any thoughts on this, Marissa? Well, I, I, I like your approach. It's probably because you taught me this approach, but I, I think it's really important not to leave the catheter in for a prolonged period of time and also set expectations ahead of time um, with your patients on what to look out for. So I think a lot of this is pre-op counseling. In a patient that's not willing to do intermittent cath, I may lead them away from a autolog an autologous sling. I may have them consider something else. But if they, even if they aren't and they're really set on an autologous sling, I do talk to them about the risks and the complications. And I think setting them up ahead of time allows the post-op course to be so much smoother. And it's important to push the envelope, but I agree with you. A lot of these women have catheter-related issues if you pull it out too soon. So I think, you know, the four to five days gives them a nice trial to see if their bladder recovers. And then I do give them several weeks after before considering doing anything else and maybe even a little bit longer. Um, and CIC, usually they're quite able to do that at that point in time because their vaginal incisions have healed and they're feeling a lot better. So a question from the audience that just popped up was, when would you go back and release a fascia? sling? What would be the timing and what is your technique? So very different from a synthetic sling. Synthetic sling, I expect those to be voiding well, pretty well in the recovery room. And if not, then within 48 hours. So a synthetic sling, if I, if someone is really having trouble, I would go back as soon as a week later just to loosen it up. Um, a fascial sling, these I will wait out for quite a while. And I'll wait these. I mean, I've seen patients who took six to eight weeks for whatever reason, I don't have a good physiologic explanation, who, you know, some might think, well, okay, at six to eight weeks, they're voiding a little bit, but no, these were patients who at six to eight weeks really were voiding pretty well and didn't have any urgency or anything like that. So I, I would wait those out. I mean, I probably would not go back uh, until at least two or three months, at least probably three months. And if I do go back, um, then it's just simply, I, I make a midline incision, usually, uh, it's pretty easy to find. The fascia is pretty distinct, and I just cut it in the midline. And in almost every case that I've ever had to do that, they void much better right afterwards, and it's very unusual that they have recurrent stress incontinence. Um, and I think that's a little distinct from the midurethral sling. When you cut those, my experience is that 30 to 50% of them do get recurrent stress incontinence, and I think that's just because there's not that much scarring and that sort of thing. Whereas with fascial slings, I think there's still plenty of scarring and some support um, such that they, they still maintain their continence.
I think if we look at other biologic slings, people have used uh, cadaveric dermis, they've used porcine materials, and I think most of the studies out there show inferior outcomes compared to using a patient's own tissue. Um, so before we finish the presentation, I, I don't want anyone to get the wrong idea. I will be honest, my go-to sling in the average patient is still a mid-urethral synthetic sling. That's what I do for the majority of the patients. However, I think that there are several situations where an autologous fascial sling is really something that we need to seriously consider and might be the preferred option, particularly if you're doing concomitant urethral surgery, uh, if someone's had a previous mesh complication. Uh, so there are a lot of different reasons, or you know, perhaps you're in a geographic locale where there's been limitations put on the use of synthetic mesh, or where you know, there's been such bad press that patients just don't want it. Uh, and also, you know, some of the cases where patients may have poor wound healing. So I think at the end of the day, you know, you really could do this in almost all stress incontinence patients. Um, so, I mean, it is a, a really a good operation. I think it is a little more invasive, obviously, than the synthetic ones. You do have more than one option for a harvest site. I think it's important to do careful vaginal dis dissection. And certainly, I think, you know, you can do a great operation, but if you tie it down uh, without uh, leaving it relatively loose, um, you ultimately can end up with a patient who is obstructed, which I don't think any of us want that. Um, any last comments, Marissa? Well, I think that you hit some important points. And as a program director for a residency, I always think about the techniques, not just how well the patient's going to do. Of course, that's my primary concern, but what can the residents learn? And so I think some of the things that you highlighted, specifically doing the inverted U incision, having residents that are able to do that approach is really important. So even if you do a midline incision for your autologous slings, considering the inverted U is so important, approaching the different harvest sites with your learners is also incredibly important because you want them to have that in their armamentarium. So even if you're comfortable, I would just make sure that all the educators out there spend a little bit of time trying these different techniques so that the residents and the fellows and the other observers in your room see a different approach and a, a different way to handle things. Um, we have some questions from the audience. If you don't have any more comments, we can go to questions, Dr. Goldman. Yes. Okay, excellent. So this this is an interesting question, and this relates to spiral slings. So it's a little bit outside of what we were talking about today, but in the sim similar vein, when would you use a spiral sling? And then also a second question, maybe before you even get to the spiral sling, is what do you do with a failed autologous sling? Sure. So a failed autologous sling, um, that's a challenge. And the first thing I do is I would make sure that when we call it failed, there are different things, different definitions of fail. So one failure would be they tell you I had stress incontinence and I still have stress incontinence and it hasn't helped or it's not quite where I want to be. And in those cases, I would consider things like a bulking agent. Um, I will admit I've actually done one or two TVTs on a patient who failed a fascial sling, which seems to be going backwards, uh, but it is what it is. We did it. But, uh, but typically if the if it's primarily stress incontinence, I would probably, at that point, try a bulking agent. Uh, you have to be careful, though, because some people may actually have developed either worsening or new urge incontinence, and that may be where the failure, quote-unquote, is. And certainly, we'll give that a little time, but in my mind, if someone has worsening or de novo urge incontinence after a sling, to me, that's obstruction until proven otherwise. And I would actually work them up very carefully. And honestly, even if someone told me that they had worsening urgent incontinence and their stream had slowed down a little bit, I'd probably get urodynamics to look for obstruction. But at the end of the day, even if they didn't have classic urodynamic evidence of obstruction, but the temporal sequence was such that they had no urgent incontinence, their flow of stream was good, now you did a sling and now their stream has slowed down a little bit and they have de novo urge, to me, that's obstruction, and I would probably cut the sling. Now, I think people can argue with that, but that would be my approach. And then this. Oh, am I not sharing the screen? You are. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> 
I was trying to give you extra time to highlight everybody. ICS 2020 Las Vegas, you've probably seen we've moved the dates. So it'll be the 18th to 21st of November. And we so look uh, forward to seeing you there. Okay, can you see our faces now or? Yes. Okay, <laughs> sorry. So what about the spiral sling? Can you talk to us a little bit about when you'd use it? So I don't have much experience with that. Um, I've actually taken a few of those out, I think. And again, there are probably a lot of people with a lot more experience on that than I. Um, if I was going to do one, I would use fascia because I've actually taken out a number of synthetic spiral slings that had just completely come eroded into the urethra. Uh, my understanding is that a lot of the patients who have spiral slings ultimately um, have trouble avoiding and are in retention, but that may be reasonable for somebody who has terrible stress incontinence. Uh, so I, that's not, to me, something that I've done a lot of, but I know that some people do it. Uh, though, just based on some of the complications that I've seen, I think if I was doing it, I would probably use um, autologous fascia. Uh, another another thing, which I didn't mention when you asked me what I would do if I failed the fascial sling, is there is that adjustable sling. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's the remix sling. And I've used that in a handful of cases, and I know others have used it. And that gives you the opportunity to sort of tension it um, after the fact. For those who are not familiar with that, the idea there is you put in, it's a little synthetic sling that's held up by two proline sutures and then is connected through a little, like a little almost, um, knob, a, li yeah. a little knob and you leave the screwdriver in it coming out through the skin. And then the next day you have the patient come in, you leave it very loose and then the patient sort of coughs, they leak, you give it a few turns, cough, leak, a few turns, and you sort of set it till they get to that point where they stop leaking. And the nice thing about that is then you pull the screwdriver out, send them home, and if six months later they come back and say, you know, I started leaking again, or maybe it's a little obstructed, you actually then can, in the office, just prep the area, make an incision, and take a sterile, one of these little special screwdrivers, and either tighten it a little more or loosen it a little more. So that's also a nice approach if um, things haven't gone the way you'd like to. And then we had uh, another question basically asking if you notice increased urinary tract infections in your patients that may be obstructed, is that maybe a sign that you use to determine or is it really their force of stream um, and their urgency? So I think you have to use all of these different things in your sort of clinical gestalt. And yeah, if somebody is starting to have more infections, then I worry about even if their PVR is low, that could have changed their voiding dynamics such that if they're having to void under higher pressures, there may not be as good blood flow to the urothelium, and that may make them more prone to infection. So yeah, if, I, if someone starts to get recurrent UTIs, I mean, I would, I would look inside to make sure there's not a suture in the bladder. Um, if it was an absorbable suture, then you could probably wait that out. Um, that's someone who I, I would very carefully look for obstruction. And then this was a, an interesting question from the audience. Um, is it easier to fix retention after an autologous sling or a birch? So that's an interesting, you know, it's it's funny. We haven't talked about birches and retropubic um, approaches. And again, I think that's those are making somewhat of a comeback as well because of some of the concerns about synthetics. Uh, I think for many of us, at least in the United States, uh, particularly in urology, many of the residents have never seen a birch. So that's one of the challenges that we face is uh, trying to sort of teach that when we ourselves haven't done them for 10 or 15 years. Um, but I will tell you, in my mind, it's a lot easier to fix retention from a sling because generally you go vaginally, you cut the sling and you're good. With a birch, people have tried to do that vaginally where you perforate up there and try to get all the sutures. I've, I've seen a bunch of patients who've been sent to me who had that done, but what happened is they couldn't get all the sutures. The flip side is um, you can do it laparoscopically or robotically. We've done a few cases where you, you just go down and take down all the scar tissue between the bladder and urethra. Um, but most of the patients I've done that were then pretty incontinent, and then we had to come back and do a sling. Um, so I think it's at least in the way I think about it, if someone is obstructed from a sling, that actually ends up being easier to deal with than a birch. That's obstructed. 
Well, um, I think we have maybe one more minute uh, for any closing thoughts, but I do want to thank everyone for joining today. And I want to make sure that everyone checks out the upcoming live streaming events that are going through the ICS um, website. So please make sure to stay tuned because I think these talks are very informative and educational. I encourage your learners to join us as well. Um, so thank you, Dr. Goldman. Thank you, ICS. And uh, thank you, listeners. We appreciate it. Everybody have a wonderful day. I was happy to talk to you. It was actually nice to have a little talk that was not COVID related. Uh, <laughs> so I hope everybody stays safe out there. Thanks, Marissa, very much. And thanks to the ICS for organizing this. Have a great day.